Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and happy Friday. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. One of our episodes this week was about balloons. Uh, not in the fun sense. N- not, not exactly. Uh, so I, ha- I had some stuff going on when the whole Chinese balloon news was happening. I was not paying attention to the news at all. Uh, But it was very difficult to not notice that there was just a ton of conversation about balloons happening. I had this, like, vague awareness that there was some kind of balloon. I was seeing headlines that said things like, why people are freaking out about spy balloons. And I was like, people are freaking out about spy balloons? Like, what is going on? Um, And because there there was just so much conversation about this balloon... And so much conversation about the Japanese balloon bombs of World War II that in my head, it morphed into one thing. And the uh, the United States military had shot down a, a, a spy balloon off the West Coast, not off the coast of South Carolina. Right. Uh, and it wasn't until I started working on this and actually reading any of these articles that I was like, oh... I kind of have a better sense of what happened. <laughs> I was not paying attention to any of this. Right. Um, I think there's also that thing, I felt like there was a wave of the initial reports splitting most people's reactions, at least on social media, which given is its own morass, um, into two camps. One of like high-level conspiracy theory and the other being like, Balloons are super outdated. It's just a balloon. Yeah. Um, and not recognizing that there could, in fact, be a lot of technology in, involved in a balloon. Um, so it was a, an interesting thing to watch develop through the lens of people's reactions. Yeah. Yes. After, um, like, after the balloon had been shot down and, like, a couple of days had passed and there was still all of this conversation about balloons and unidentified objects that were being shot down, that was when I was sort of starting to look at the news again. And I started people seeing people who were like, this is all a distraction to distract everybody from the train derailment that happened. And I was like, this too much is going on. Right. Um, so there is a monument to uh the people who were killed in Oregon by this balloon bomb. And in 2021, it was threatened by a forest fire. Um, and at the monument, like, there is a monument with, you know, the names of the people who were killed on it. Like, that's there. But then there's also a tree that had shrapnel embedded in it from when it ex- it exploded. And, like, that's the shrapnel tree. And so there were these efforts to, like, save this one specific tree during this forest fire, which I think they did successfully do. Like, they wrapped the whole tree to try to protect it. The I think Park Service website says this site is currently inaccessible. So I think post-fire, it has not returned to having public access yet. But there is a monument there to that. I uh, had a moment when we were talking about the Japanese tissue paper la- um, balloons and their testing procedure, mm-hmm. where I was like, if I were an installation artist, boy, would I want to do some sort of piece that featured that beautiful lit floor setup where they would Mm. look for holes because Mm -hmm. that would be an amazing way to, like, one, actually show people how kind of fascinating this entire procedure was to build these things but yeah. two like you could you know listen if there are any artists in the crowd that want to work on an installation about the technology and art of war this is your idea i give it to you go freely <laughs> yeah yeah um one of the reasons that they went with these paper balloons the um the paper itself is made from a like a shrub that's related to the mulberry tree and a lot of people just call it mulberry paper even though like it's a slightly different species of plant but like it was all stuff that was not critically needed for some other aspect of the war effort like that was why they didn't really 
want to go with like the rubberized balloons was they needed rubber for other reasons. Right. So the the only thing of of all of it that really did seem like uh, m- more of a like a critical wartime need was the fact that there were edible roots being used to make the paste itself. Uh, and hunger was just such a huge problem in so much of Japan um, with people literally starving to death. And so the fact that people were stealing, I feel like stealing, like, what are you going to do? You're going to starve to death, you're going to eat the paste. Like, <laughs> Yeah, stealing has such negative connotations. Stealing has connotations I don't like there, but like that that part of the story about, uh, about these schoolgirls basically uh, trying to subsist on the paste that they were using to make this balloon paper uh, struck me a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's super interesting. I had not thought about how... I had this moment while we were recording the episode, and particularly, even though I had read it, it really struck me when we were saying the words. Uh, talking about the Allied forces' use of of balloons with the trailing cords after Winston Churchill was like, <laughs> I think that'll work. And I literally like the idea that it was like, oh no, these will drag onto trees and cause forest fires. And I just had one of those like heartbreak moments of like, humans are awful. Yeah. The fact that they were slowly dripping mineral oil uh, was also a thing that I was not. Yeah, all of that. I was just like, this is on the one hand so interesting because the way they're problem solving to like maintain altitude while simultaneously traveling across distances are kind of neat. And then it was like, but all of this, all of this is just because we all want to kill each other. And I got very sad for a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh war is bad. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> my my, my hippie moment of the day. Uh yeah, I have a lot of hippie moments when we talk about um anything related to like wars and combat and fighting and um it's like the balloons that Japan was launching just were ingenious in so many ways and they were also made to indiscriminately harm people, which was why uh why there was a ban that was Im- implemented on using balloons as bombers um there are other international laws and treaties and things that are in place now that are like more specifically about things like aircraft steerable aircraft things like airplanes like there are other laws that are related to like bombs that are not just about balloons um obviously but anyway Anyway, uh, I'm still sort of baffled that for a period of time, it seems like even though I was not totally aware of everything that was going on in the world, it seemed like every time I looked at anything, it was about balloons. And I was like, what is happening? Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> balloons. Yeah. No, not can have such a uh, an iconic image of joy has so often been actually used in a very harmful mm-hmm. way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We talked about G.K. Chesterton this week and specifically his anti-eugenics uh, advocacy. Yes. I really... <laughs> That part we want to hug him for, but the other parts, pfft. really frustrating. Yeah, um, yeah. After the yeah, Ellen Swallow Richards was just like the latest example of talking about somebody who had so many things about their lives that seemed so cool, and then it's like, oh, and eugenics. And I was like, I just, I really want to talk about somebody that 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 opposed it, like from the beginning. I said that at the top of the show. Um, I did some digging around. There were a few people that I was sort of uh, thinking about doing an episode on, and I I finally wound up on G.K. Chesterton before really uh, realizing, like, the scope of the anti-Semitism discussion Mm -hmm. and the fact that there are people that we're probably going to get emails from who will just vigorously defend all allegations 
of anti-Semitism right. against him. And, and the, like, the argument really comes off to me as being like, but he had Jewish friends and he condemned Hitler. And it's like, sure, that can be true. This writing over here that he wrote and right, signed exactly. his name to, though, like, that also is true. Do you know what it reminds me of in a different way? Uh, is H.P. Lovecraft, because sure. his writing's super-duper racist. But his wife, who he divorced, but they remained friends, and she always sort of advocated for a, a much better image of him than some people had, was always like, no, he really loves Black people individually. He just likes to write things to rile people up. And I'm like, okay, that's still racist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, like, I... I, if it's not clear to people that it is somehow, like, a tool to make people think, then you're probably just feeding people that want to think that already anyway. Right, right. Um, I do, like, part of me was like, sh- should we do more than one installment? Like, should should it be a multi-part G.K. Chesterton episode? Because there really just there's so much to talk about. And in the course of research, I read, like, a 5,000-word essay that was just on the detective stories and a different 5,000-word essay that was just on <laughs> the literary biographies and a different 5,000-word essay that was just, like, there were all these different... Five thousand. I'm like, who's commissioning five thousand word essays on G.K. Chesterton? Because they were all about that long, and they were all focused on like a discrete part of his uh, his literary career, which did have a lot of overlap. Like a lot of these things pulled in multiple different genres and different. Like his uh, his fiction would be very influenced by his political ideas and all of this stuff. Uh, and I was like, we're just we're not going to be able to do justice to any of it in one episode. And then I was like, we're not. We wouldn't be able to do justice in two episodes either, or even three. Right. And also, my thing that I was hoping to have to just talk about, great, somebody that opposed eugenics was like, oh, and now we need to talk about anti-Semitism. And also, like, the sexism part, too, that we referenced. Humans are imperfect and complicated, but um, I did find it a little annoying that the thing that I chose for myself specifically that I, because I wanted some opposition to eugenics was also like, and we also have this other part we have to get into. And also gross. Yeah. 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 His writing about Jewish people reminded me of a very recent event of a well-known comic strip artist posting a rant about Black people Mm-hmm. and how white people should stay away from them. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this is the same rhetoric. It's just been shifted around mm-hmm. to modern language. Like, why? Why? Mm-hmm. Why does anybody go like, yeah, this is a reasonable thing to say? Mm-hmm. I don't understand. Yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the the things that people have written that have tried to defend uh, G.K. Chesterton, like, it really reminds me of when someone will say something really racist and defenders will be like, but look at this picture of this person with a Black person. And it's like, that does not erase the thing that he just said, right? So, uh, I, I got very, I got very frustrated with some of that, with the, uh, the attempts to just, like, not just minimize it, but sort of pretend that it that it didn't matter. That like this, like being one of the first people to really vocally condemn Adolf Hitler somehow undid a lot of writing that was just inherently anti-Semitic and how it talked about like Jewish people as a group. Yeah. Um I <laughs> will reiterate the thing that I said in the in the top of the episode about how um we're not gonna armchair diagnose him. He reminded me though, the the parts of uh of his story that were about like learning to to speak and to read like later than a lot of other children do, and also seeming to like have a tendency to be uh disorganized and kind of a daydreamer like all of these things reminded me of multiple people in my life many of those multiple people have diagnoses of some sort and none of them are the same diagnosis right. <laughs> and so um that's one of the many reasons that I'm like I just don't I'm not comfortable with like a, an an armchair labeling 
uh, of any of this. Um, because among other things, I'm not a psychiatrist. <laughs> right. Well, and we, I mean, as we've often said, like, unless the person is here and you yeah. can actually, like, do testing on them, you know, or, or, you know, run them through, like, various exercises that would help determine those things, mm. you're kind of stabbing in the dark. And that also has the potential to be like damaging to people who could take that information and self-diagnose or like yeah, apply yeah, yeah, it to yeah, somebody yeah. else. So like it's just it's too too dangerous. Um do you want to hear a a silly thing? Yes. Every time we mention Hilaire Belloc, I think of Belloc from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which might just be because I want to think of Paul Freeman because I think he is very handsome. Mm-hmm. And Raiders of the Lost Ark is a little difficult for me. I love it. But I'm like, but the bad guy is very appealing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he is from that same, you know, group of actors for me as Vincent Cassell where they could play like the evilest men on earth. And I'm like, yeah, but maybe they're actually the one that you should side with. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's my... Listen, I have indie on the brain. We're about to get a new indie movie this year. Oh, yeah. It's all very exciting. But Paul Freeman is blazingly handsome in Raiders to me. Yeah. 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 It's all beautiful, beautiful blue eyes. All right. So, you know, a little <laughs> bit like a lizard. Maybe you can't trust him. Very appealing. Sure. I don't understand it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that seems like a reasonable place to wrap up our behind the scenes. Uh, whatever's happening on your weekend. I hope it's good. And if it's not good, I hope you have a moment to just just recover. Uh, I know a lot of folks have a lot of things going on right now. Um, you can send us a note if you would like. We're at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. And we will be back with a Saturday classic tomorrow and a brand new episode on Monday. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.